Um, well, thank you very much, Emmanuel, and um, thank you for a great conference and being a great host. Uh, thank you to Adrian for inviting us to give the highlights of Ayuga. Um, Emmanuel's really given you the, 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 the highlights of the conference in general, so I'm going to focus a little bit more on the scientific program. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a consultant here, a gynaecologist, and I work here at King's College Hospital in southeast London in the UK. And these are my relevant disclosures, uh, but perhaps my most relevant disclosure is the fact that I was the scientific chairman of the 40th Iuga meeting in Nice. So if you don't like what you're about to hear, I'm the one to blame for it, so I apologize in advance. Uh, this is just really a brief overview of the science that was presented. So we had 677 abstracts, 30 videos. Uh, we had 60 podium presentations. So you can see if you submitted a paper, you had around a 10% chance of getting a podium and around a 13% chance of getting an oral poster. Um, Emmanuel's already mentioned some of the features we had. It was Emmanuel's uh, idea to have these little mini state-of-the-art lectures, which were 15-minute snapshots of the most relevant up-to-date information, which were, really were a great success, and it's something we're going to be doing next year. We had the normal things, such as stump the professors, meet the experts, the round tables um, sessions, and of course, the state-of-the-art lectures. Uh, we had an ongoing video salon, so people could just sit down and watch videos at their own leisure. Um, and um, last year, we had electronic non-discussed posters, but I think we're going to change that again s the next year, and I think follow a similar method to the one you have here in ICS. So in Iuga last year, we had three prizes. The prize for the best overall abstract was the Axel Ingelmann Sunberg Award, and that was won by Rufus Cartwright from Imperial College in London. The identification of two novel genomic loci associated with stress and urgency urinary incontinence in a genome-wide association study, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. The best fellows abstract, or doctor in training, was cabinoid resistor expression in the bladder resulted in detrusor overactivity. That was from Evie Bacali and the group from Leicester in the UK. And the best video was from Nicholas Viet Rubin, uterus preserving prolapse repair by lateral suspension from the group in Geneva. So the overall uh, best abstract was um, by Rufus Cartwright, and this was a, a genomic uh, gene-wide association study, and they um, looked at the genome-wide association in 13,000 women and identified two loci with strong associations with stress and urgency incontinence. Macro, which codes for macrophage receptor, mediates bacterial colonization, and EDN1, which codes for endothelium, and consequently endothelium antagonists may represent a new class of drug for overactive bladder. Best Fellows abstract, as I mentioned, was cabinoid receptor expression in the bladder is altered into trusor overactivity. Um, so this study compared cabinoid receptor expression in normal human bladder and those with detrusor overactivity. Using quantitative PCR, they detected differences in CB1 and CB2 receptor transcripts in bladder specimens and then uh, found that CB1 receptor was reduced in patients with detrusor overactivity when compared to normal controls. So consequently, that may contribute to, inc to increase contractility in these patients, and therefore perhaps cabinoid agonists may have a potential role in the treatment of overactive bladder. So, of course, as you can manage, imagine, a lot of our meeting in the IUG was uh, discussing urogenital prolapse, and one of the weaknesses of urogenital prolapse studies is very often you don't see the long-term results. This year we were lucky, and this is one of the big studies from the French group, looking at a seven-year follow-up of a randomized controlled trial comparing prolift versus conventional vaginal wall repair. Uh, and you can see in terms of a primary composite outcome, um, looking at objective symptoms and no reoperation, there was no difference in terms of primary out outcome repair between a mesh kit and, and native tissue, although the anatomical success rate was high with mesh. No difference in dyspyrunia rates, which was interesting. Mesh exposure of around 40%, with around 13% requiring mesh excision. So at seven years, composite success rates tended to be similar between the mesh and no mesh group. So perhaps maybe we should think about um, using less mesh and thinking more about native tissue repairs. Of course, not all of our patients need uh, operations for urogenital prolapse, and this was another nice long-term study um, from Suzanne Hagen and a group in Glasgow uh, reporting on the long-term follow-up of the POPPY study, which was a randomized controlled trial of pelvic floor exercises for women with urogenital prolapse. So they then followed up this second paper, the women at two years, and as you can see at the bottom of the slide, fewer prolapse symptoms in the intervention arm, 
uh, and greater intervention in the control group as opposed to the intervention arm. And where symptoms remained better at two years in the intervention arm, these were not significant, but nevertheless, a long-term benefit of pelvic floor muscle training. Another long-term study was from Sushma Shakrishna and our own group at King's, which was looking at patient and surgeon goal retrieval 10 years following surgery for urogenital and prolapse. And as you can see, these patients were followed up objectively and then subjectively using a number of different quality of life measures. At 10 years, the overall objective cure of incontinence was around 85%, and there remained a significant improvement in PGII and quality of life, with also a mean goal achievement both in patients and surgeons of just over 80%. 80%. So I think another good long-term study supporting our use of um, surgery for urogenital prolapse. Of course, overactive bladder um, remains important, and we're now very focused on combination therapy. Uh, I spotted this um, study because this is a different type of combination therapy. So this is a, a small study from Japan looking at solifenesin versus solifenesin with local vaginal estrogens in around 100 women with overactive bladder. And as you can see, there was no difference between these groups in terms of symptoms, although there was a significant improvement in quality of life in both groups. And I think there, there may well be a benefit of local vaginal estrogens, and I think it's important perhaps that we look at this with further work. In terms of epidemiology, another long-term study, a 14-year follow-up study of a randomized controlled trial of subtotal hysterectomy versus total abdominal hysterectomy, um, and as you can see, with a very good follow-up even after 14 years. Interestingly, subjective stress incontinence was higher in the subtotal hysterectomy group, although there was no difference in terms of other lower urinary tract symptoms. Factors associated with incontinence were previous incontinence prior to surgery, local estrogen therapy, and also being overweight. And increased BMI was also associated with mixed incontinence and symptoms of urinary urgency. Another nice epidemiological study from Ian Milson's unit in Gothenburg looking at the long-term effects of vacuum extraction on pelvic floor um, function in a group of um, primiparous women identified through the Swedish database. Uh, and as you can see, vacuum extraction was not a risk factor for pelvic floor dysfunction when compared to spontaneous vaginal delivery. And third, second and third degree tears were the strongest risk factors for two, for two or more types of pelvic floor dysfunction, whilst emergency cesarean section was protective. So moving on to the posterior compartment, and I'm going to present two studies from uh, the group in the UK from Mayday Hospital, and the first of these is looking at the effect of subsequent vaginal delivery on bowel symptoms and anorectal function in women who sustained an a a obstetric anal sphincter injury. And basically what they did was they developed a treatment protocol um, recommending vaginal delivery if the anal sphincter tear was less than 30% of the, the clock face, and also on manometry if squeeze was greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. And as you can see at the bottom of the slide, there was a 9% instance of recurrent obst obstetric anal sphincter injury, but no new uh, sphincter defects on scan. So that perhaps this is a way that we can counsel our women who've had one anal sphincter injury how to deliver the next time. So what happens if women have had two anal sphincter injuries, where do we go then? So again, work from the, from the same group using the same protocol um, based on trans or transanal ultrasound and um, manometry. And again, based on this treatment protocol, there was no significant change in the scent marks and continent score in those women who've had pre two previous anal sphincter injuries and no significant worsening of anorectal function. So again, I think useful clinical um, um, advice to, to tell our women. And what about the effect of mediolateral episiotomy in obstetric anal sphincter injury? This is a huge retrospective case control series of around 41,000 vaginal births from the group in Leicester. And you can see overall the rate of obstetric anal sphincter injury was around 4.4%. And using a multivariate variate regression, a, a obstetric anal sphincter injury was strongly associated with birth weight, age, being primiparous, forceps delivery and von Thue's delivery, whereas episiotomy and epidural tended to be protective. And finally, I was just going to finish by showing you three very select systematic reviews. I think on the scientific committee, systematic reviews always give us a problem. It's, it's good science, it's of interest, but they don't make for the most dynamic presentations. So this is very much the headline. So 
Does the outcome of botulinum toxin treatment differ in overactive bladder patients with detrusor acti overactivity compared to those without? And you can see looking at um, 437 papers, of which four were studied, you can see it makes no difference in terms of response rate, whether it was urodynamically proved detrusion overactivity or not. Which mid-urethral uh, sling for intrinsic sphincter deficiency? This was presented by the group led by Annabel, uh, Abigail Ford, uh, looking at 55 randomized controlled trials comparing retropubic and transobturator tapes. Overall, the retropubic tapes tended to be more effective, although Q tended to be lower subjectively with transobturator tapes. There was no difference in objective cure between the two. So I think showing a tendency to prefer um, retropubic um, but not, uh, not so much in terms of objective terms. And the final uh, systematic review that I'll present is the laparoscopic culprit culprit suspension, uh, a Cochrane update. So this was looking at 27 trials uh, involving laparoscopic culpo suspension, and they first of all compared open with laparoscopic culpo suspension. As you can see, there was no difference in terms of subjective outcome and objective outcome, although there was a trend towards less pain, fewer complications, and sort of shorter hospital stay in the laparoscopic group. They then went on to compare laparoscopic culpo sus suspension versus mid-urethral slings, and you can see no difference in terms of subjective outcome, although objectively there was a better outcome with a mid-urethral sling. Longer operating time and hospital stay, of course, in the laparoscopic group as compared to the, lapros uh, to the um, mid-urethral sling group. Um, so with that, I hope that was, a, that was a bit of a rush through of the scientific highlights of Iuga. Um, our next meeting, as you can see, is in Cape Town at the beginning of August next year. Uh, the abstract submission is soon to open. The abstract submission will, uh, date will close on the 29th of February. Uh, and I, I encourage all of you to think about coming to join us in Iuga. And um, we're very much looking forward to seeing as many of you there as possible. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you.